Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to Medieval Church History. I'm Teresa Holman, and with me is Father Michael Witt. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Teresa. We um, are in a kind of a nasty time right now. (laughs) Not too much fun, not much fun to look at, really, but... Now we History know where, well uh, worth knowing, I suppose. Yeah. Now we know where all the the writers of the Mad Max series got the material. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, I it's, guess it's so. It's pretty rough. Yeah. And today, the title of our show is The System of Vassals and Lords, Cooperation. Maybe a glimmer of hope in the... In the yes. Uh, yes, there will be a glimmer of hope, but I'm sorry to say it won't be a glimmer of hope for the church. It's still not pretty. No, the cooperation is going to mean that the church has to cooperate in some oh. ways in which the church was not meant to cooperate. Yes. And uh, and it'll take later on... Uh, it's going to take a, a long struggle, really, um, uh, in, in, in a whole group of reformers, from monks to queen, queens to emperors, good emperors, bad emperors, popes. Uh, it's it's going to be a long struggle before the church is able to free itself and truly uh, return to it, its roots in that, in that glorious 13th century. Um, it, 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 but it's a very interesting story, and it's a story, I think, of great hope. It's it's looking back at uh, at people like uh, Gregory the Great, uh, Leo the Great, Nicholas the Great, and remembering um, them and and using them as models, and then great hope and and knowing what the church is meant to be, and then doing what has to be done, even right. though it's not convenient. And I think for us in the 21st century, again, history has some wonderful lessons for us, mm-hmm. and they're not pretty lessons, but they're tough lessons and lessons that that we ourselves can um, can take to heart even as we face what we think are insurmountable, insurmountable challenges in actuality. Uh, we've been through worse. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, as we left off last time around, we were looking at this rather unique being who was going to pull together the Western civilization. That is the armored knight, the mm-hmm. armored mounted knight. And I'd just like to say a few things about him before we look at one other group that is not going to be the answer, that is the family. Um, we need to take a, a little look at, uh, at, at the family also um, and then see how this brotherhood of knights is, is going to be the answer. So the central government was not the answer. The family structure uh, is not the answer. It's going to be something a little bit larger than that, somewhere in between, and it's going to be that brotherhood of uh, blood and steel, uh, really. We have this knight. Um, he has to be incredibly trained. You know, the, the Part of the expense of the knight is going to be the armor. Right. Uh, that's and, and we're not, again, thinking in terms of plate armor like the sh- knight in shining armor thing, but uh, that helmet... The uh, the chain mail, mm-hmm. which has to be individually made, every every loop in that has to be made and and, and placed, and then whatever uh, sections of of, uh, of body armor he'll have, um, his weapons those are not cheap. Those are going to be difficult to forge and make. Um, his shield uh, that's going to be expensive. A horse, not just one horse, but uh, a knight needs to have two, perhaps even three. Horses and the upkeep on these are going to be expensive, also. So he has, and but the important thing behind all of this is going to be the leisure time in order to practice. Uh-huh. I mean, when I use that word leisure, we tend to think about going out and playing around a golf. It's going to be rough work. I right. mean, uh, this is uh, this is brutal practice, and um, and and so all of those things brought together. You know, there's, a, there's a saying back in this century that that goes like this. You can make a lad at puberty into a horseman. Later than that, never. Uh-huh. So you've got to find a kid 
who has the abilities, the raw athletic abilities and the intellectual abilities at a young age and then work with him very early on, 12, 13, 14 years old. And then you've got the possibilities of a horseman, but not before that, or not after that. Uh, you, you have some fellow who's 18 years old, he's too old. Isn't that something? Wow. Yeah. Charlemagne is really the one who accidentally puts all of this in motion by granting, as we had talked about before, uh, by granting the, uh, the feudum to um, various lords, by, by giving these, um, uh, these lands to these various lords in exchange for their service. And these individuals, and they're, they're literally uh, hundreds, ulti ultimately thousands, are going to be known, <clears throat> first of all, by their Latin term, miles, simply meaning soldier. <clears throat> However, when you get into the modern languages, that's going to change. And there's some very interesting uh, insights into this. For instance, in English, we call a man armored horseman. We call him a knight, right? comes from the um, early German term, the Anglo-Saxon term, connect, oh. which in modern terms is a servant. Okay? On the other hand, both the French and the Germans, as they develop their own language, <coughs> they ta take on a, uh, a, a real essence of what this, what this man really is. He's more than just a servant. He's more than just a soldier. He is a horseman. And so in French, the term for knight is chevalier, mm. from the French term cheval, meaning a horse. Right? Uh, in, in German, the term is ritter, and it comes from the um, Germanic term reiter, one who rides a horse. Uh, today the word for horse in German is pferd, the old term was ross. So there's a ross, reiter, ritter, there's a tie-in uh, in, in all of those, a, the, a root in there. Um, all of this is involved. The relationship between the Lord and the vassal is involved in a voluntary act of swearing absolute fealty. And so then uh, you become what's known as the vasi dominici, uh, the vassal of the Lord and you receive um, some fief in exchange for that fealty, that, that loyalty. You then, as I mentioned uh, in our last uh, program, you then, as a vassal, have the opportunity to subdivide your uh, fief then into other sections, and you can become a lord to other vassals. Ultimately, these are men who could be called to rally with other men to defend towns, cathedral cities, monasteries, and man for man on their horse, they are an easy match for the Saracens, as they found out at the Battle of Tours, are the Magyars, are the Vikings. Okay. And that's going to be the, uh, the grounding for the stability. It's going to be through cooperation. That's going to be the grounding for the stability of, uh, of Europe but they wanted something in return. Obedience. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be <laughs> obeyed. Not because they were haughty, but because everything relied upon everybody doing what they had to do. Right. Uh, independence was simply not part of the program. Now, I, I said I wanted to take a, a quick look at the lowest or the most uh, basic structure in society which is the family. You know, and I'm talking about not the nuclear family so much as the extended family. Okay. Uh, the term for that in, uh, in, uh, among the old Romans was the gens. We, we get the word genitive uh, from that, uh, that term. Uh, a gens is a clan. It's beyond the, the nuclear family. It's the clan itself. Like, for instance, Julius Caesar uh, belong to a gens, even beyond, you know, uh, Caesar was his name, his mm -hmm. personal name. Julius was his family, oh, okay. right? He belonged to another extended, extended family called the Gaius family. And so that's the gens. That's, uh, and everybody in the Gaius family kind of 
they were all aware of each other, they kind of took care of each other. Mm -hmm. um, the Julian family certainly took care of each other. And, and so there's that relationship of, of people standing by each other. Mm -hmm. And that goes back into ancient, ancient Roman times, uh, pre-Christian times by, by a, a, quite a bit. The Germans had something similar, but it was breaking down because of all the movement that they had um, moving into the Roman Empire, then moving around, and then uh, under the chaos of, of the uh, Dark Ages. Their relationship was, uh, it, it's simply known as the Geschlechter, uh, literally means relatives. And what we find, at least embodied in the epic poems of the German peoples, is a special relationship between, the, the, if there's a bond of relationship that would be similar to the Roman gens, in the German tribes there's a bond of relationship between nephews and the maternal uncle. Okay. Okay. The brother of their mother uh -huh. has a special relationship with the sons of that mother. And I, I often wondered why. I mean, you know, uh, Mark Blanc mentions this in passing, and I didn't, I, it didn't dawn on me until I sat myself down and started thinking about the relationship. You know that if you, um, you, you would not have uh, that same relationship between a, a paternal <laughs> uncle and the nephews because there's a certain possible rivalry. Oh, sure. You okay. get the idea? Yes. You know, my brother's sons could possibly someday be my rival mm -hmm. in, in, in what I have. On the other hand, I have nothing but a fiduciary relationship with my sister's sons. Right. You know, Somewhere. and so therefore there is that that bond of uh, of loyalty that's built up in and and uh, but that's it, as far as the the German <laughs> society goes. Now today we pass um, the our names through paternal sanguinity. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know I'm I'm known as Michael John Witt because my father was Michael Joseph Witt mm -hmm. because his father was was Charles Witt because his father was William Joseph Witt and we go back you know before that you're back in Germany uh -huh. but there's that constant passing on through the um, uh, the the, uh, the father's side name. It's just right. the way we do this in Western civilization. The Spanish are a little bit more complex um, in bringing mother and Both father's names, names together. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but the Germans, interestingly enough, and this persisted into the Middle Ages, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, tended to uh, give a different picture. And again, I go back to Mark Bloch. He, he uses one Germanic family to show how uh, these relationships are and how they are not solid enough or a family can defend itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and he uses a family uh, in which the father and mother, uh, the father's name is Toid Rikus. Toid Rikus. Okay. okay. And the mother's name <laughs> is... Ermin Bertha. Oh boy. <laughs> That's pretty German, huh? <laughs> and so they had three sons. And the sons' names were the oldest son was Toid Hardos. <laughs> so he gets the Toid from Dad. Uh -huh. Okay. The second son is Ermin Arius. Oh, okay. He gets from mom. From mom. And then the third son, they pull together mom and dad's name, and his name is Toit Bertus. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's, that's the Toit the from the father from and the Bert uh -huh. from the mother, Bert, Bertha, oh, yeah. and, and pulls it together. <laughs> One of the interesting things I found with this was that the, while the root of each of those names is either from the mother or from the father, do you notice something about the suffix? It's all Latin. Mm -hmm. So even the Germans were taking on, they were Latinizing their German names <laughs> uh, in that. So you had Teut Hertus, Ermund Arius, mm -hmm. and Teut Bertus, the, that U.S. at the end. Um, even as late as the Middle Ages, you have uh, the Hundred Years' War. At the trial of Joan of Arc, when Joan is asked her name, she says the following. She says, I am sometimes called Jeanne d'Arc. Remember, her father is uh, Jacques d'Arc. Mm -hmm. 
and sometimes called Jean Rome. Her mother's name was uh, um, Isabel Rome. So this whole thing about last names that we consider to be so normal today, in fact, um, wasn't uh, in the Middle Ages. And what's the point behind all of this? The point was that the family unit was too unstable to be relied upon as the source of security and safety. Now, to, I, you know, when I was in high school and I took uh, political science, I was told that the that the basic unit of any society is the nuclear family, father, mother, children. Uh, now, of course, that that very definition is under attack, right. uh, as we it's see certainly. in courts and and uh, various states. <laughs> but that's pretty rude. Mm -hmm. And even as rude as it was in the Middle Ages, it wasn't strong enough to be able to defend the family unit, and so you had to find other ways to do that. And so, um, what happens is then that men band together in this. As I said, it was a brotherhood of of, uh, of blood and iron and the iron is the armor that they're wearing, the blood is that's shed <coughs> and uh, they seek this stability beyond their families. Now there are exceptions to this and particularly the Celts. Uh, we'll find this in Ireland and in Scotland. Uh, the family units, and extended family units will continue to have that, that strong sense of stability somewhat to the detriment of, of the Celts in both of those areas, both in Ireland and in Scotland, uh, because they're constantly at war with each other. Now, um, so the answer then is going to be this feudalism and the relationship between the feudal lord and the feudal vassal is known as homage. Uh, okay. And to understand homage and how homage takes place you have to go to an ordination of a Catholic priest. Uh, okay. If you ever do that, if you've ever been to an ordination, you'll uh, see homage in action. Uh, there is that, that moment in which um, the uh, ordinand comes and kneels before the bishop. Right. You're shaking your head. You've been to an ordination I have, before. Yes. Yeah. And you remember there's that scene where he takes his hands in a prayer position and he places them in front of the bishop and the bishop then takes his hands and folds them and, and folds the ordinand's hands he folds his hands around the other mm -hmm. uh, around the the deacon and then uh, prays over them that is that, that that's the same kind of relationship in fact almost the same actions that take place at the time of an um, of a uh, homage the two men face each other the one sitting is any age, any age at all. He could be a little boy, or he could be a very elderly man, but he's sitting on that throne. He is the Lord. Okay. The man who is kneeling in front of him typically is going to be around 20 years old. It could be a little bit older, it could be a little bit younger, but typically around 20 years old. The one is wishing to serve. That's why he's kneeling there. And the other is agreeing to be served. He's the one sitting on the throne. As I say, the, the, uh, he puts his hands there as in a prayer position. The other wraps his hands around. It's a sign of submission. Mm -hmm. And then with those, that submission, he simply says this to the man, uh, to, to the, the Lord, I am your man. That's what he says, I am your man. The ceremony in German is called Mannschaft. Uh, it, it's uh, the manning, the making one a man to mm -hmm. another. Uh, in English, it comes as homage, and that comes actually from the French, because the actual term that's used, the, the statement that's made by the by the knight to as a vassal to the Lord is, "Je suis votre homme de bouche et de main." I am your man, of mouth and of hand. So I will not speak against you. I will always defend you with my mouth, and I will always defend you with my arm. Okay. Okay. And then that's that's the homage that takes place. Later on, there's a second ritual that's added to that. It's a very simple ritual, as you can see. It, it uh, although it has certain religious trappings, it is not religious. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no invocation of of the divine here. But not very much later than that, a second uh, ritual takes place. And at that time, 
uh, Christian symbols are used. So after you now have swear, sworn yourself, I am your man, then there's a second uh, ritual that takes place in which the vassal is then puts his hand or both hands on the gospel book mm -hmm. or on a relic, and he at that point swears by God fealty or faithfulness to uh, the Lord. Again, the, the, the terms in other languages are very poignant. For French, it's known as foi. Okay, it's faith. In, in German, it's troia. It's, it's true. Or again, mm -hmm. that sense of, of faith. So it goes beyond. Now, so it, now it becomes a truly religious act. Okay. Interestingly enough, this must be done in person. Mm -hmm. These acts cannot be done in proxy. They must be done in person. The two people, two men, need to be there at that time. And it must be repeated every time one of the persons changes. Oh, okay. So if a duke <clears throat> dies, you know, I mentioned it could, that, that lord could be a little boy. Take a, take a case of, of a, a duke who is killed in battle, and he's then succeeded to the throne by his son, who is four years old. Mm -hmm. And the little kid's sitting up there, and uh, and now it comes time for a 20-year-old man to make his oath of loyalty. It seems like a strange scene, but this 20-year-old man could be kneeling there and putting his arms out, putting his hands in, in a prayer position, and this little 4-year-old boy who couldn't even get his hands around, he does, mm -hmm. in, a, in a spiritual way, get his hands around that, uh, mm -hmm. that nobleman. Well... Hmm. Um, with with all of the, the violence and the chaos at the end of the Carolingian um, period, you have a shift in positions that, that take place. And so as a result, um, men are uh, be, become so desperate that they are willing to enter into this kind of service. Other men are so desperate to receive this kind of service that they do. However, there's a whole class of men who become so desperate. Remember I talked about in the last uh, program about peasants who were willing to die in mass, that they, they gathered together without any armor, any kind of protection, no training, and they took whatever, uh, you know, a hammer or a sickle or a, a butcher knife, whatever, and they all rushed the barbarians to, to die together. <coughs> there are some men who are so desperate that they were willing to die. There were other men who were so desperate but wanting to live. To avoid death. To avoid death. And so what these men did was they took their families and they went to a local lord or some lord and they begged for the opportunity to become a vassal. And the local lord said to them, I'm sorry, I don't have a fee for you. And besides that, I really don't care for your service. You can't do anything to, you know, you're, you're not a you fighter. <laughs> what can you do? Mm hmm and so this peasant looks around and he says, I know how to grow food. I know how to take care of pigs. And so the Lord says, well, okay, we'll let you come onto my land. I'll give you protection. You take care of my pigs. You take care of my farmland. You oversee my, uh, my, my gardens or my vineyards or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can do that, and your family can stay here also. They can live in this little hut over on the side. But you can't pick up and leave whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. You have to stay here from now on, and your children have to also. And I will decide who um, your sons and daughters are going to marry. Oh, my gosh. That, that was probably their only hope for survival, I suppose. exactly right. Mm -hmm. It was their only hope for survival. And this was as close a thing that, as you're going to find in, in Western Europe to slavery. It's right. not slavery, but it's pretty darn close. It's not slavery because they chose to do it. Got it. But yet, in some ways, they were required to do it for their survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And as a result, you have a whole class of people, the lowest class of people that mm -hmm. survives for centuries and centuries. They're called serfs. serfs. These are serfs. And in Russia, 
these serfs do not become independent until the 1860s. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Well, now, wait a minute. Before you do that, you're an American. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We still had slavery true. in this country. This, and that was slavery. That, that wasn't was real serfdom. slavery. That was real mm -hmm. slavery. So, and, 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 of course, as we know, much to our uh, shame, slavery continues even to into the 21st century. Absolutely, it does. Yeah, it, it's one of the... the uh, one of the great scourges, one of the horrors. The United Nations doesn't want to talk much about it. Nobody wants to talk much about it. It's actually Christian churches that are talking about it. The Catholic Church certainly is. Evangelical churches, especially in Central Africa and mm -hmm. Eastern Africa, talk about this, this terrible scourge that continues on. Um, but it, it's been with us these many, many centuries. And here we find a whole class of people in Western Europe who literally insurf themselves mm -hmm. for safety's sake. Wow. Um, most of the vassals live on their own feasts. While there are these serfs, it's a relatively small group of people. And uh, although, and in some countries, they'll, as a class, they'll die out. Uh, England, for, for one. Uh, in France, they'll continue on. There'll be something similar to serfdom into the early modern period. But as time goes on, more and more um, Western Europeans will, will drop this and get rid of it. It'll linger in Eastern Europe, especially in Russia, but for the most part, um, be done away with. Most people are going to be Lord's vassals, okay? And, and the vassals themselves are interesting to look at. Many of them are going to live on their fiefs. So they're going to be living on the lands themselves, and they'll have other men who will be doing, um, other families who will be doing the, uh, the basics so that they have the leisure to continue on their, their military um, studies. Mm -hmm. um, others are going to be called household vassals, and these are especially younger men. They're going to be in attendance, living at a manor, or more specifically at a castle, uh, they will eat and drink well. Uh, when you look at their daily intake, uh, they are uh, beef eaters. These are, these are uh, high-protein eaters, mm -hmm. uh, but they're going to need that. Uh, their duties include uh, riding escort for people who leave the castle or the manor in order to um, provide safety, uh, guarding the facility itself, and then also a, a lot of administrative uh, duties. Um, many of them are going to be able to read and write and, um, and, and, and do those kind of duties also. But as I mentioned before, you've got to have very young boys brought in early on. And so the, the Lord is always going to be looking at, at young boys and, and looking for those who are bright and uh, are um, athletic uh -huh. uh, to be able to uh, to, to be uh, to be able to be brought in and um, and take on these roles. These kids um, are going to have a life that a high school athlete would dream of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you could imagine a high school athlete um, not having to go to class, <laughs> oh, a couple hours, you know, a little bit of uh, reading and writing and some various things like that. But he spends the rest of his day basically practicing. Mm -hmm. That's basically all he does. He's going to be doing writing a lot of writing and I'm not talking in terms of writing from one point to another or racing or something like that he is going to become one with the horse he's going to have to learn this as a young boy as he gets into his teen years he's going to have to be able to feel the movement of the horse he's going to have to be able to to uh, command through his body not through his, his words but through his body the horse to move in particular ways these horses in the Middle Ages were battle horses. These were war horses. And it doesn't mean that they're just a bunch of big Clydesdales. Right. These horses were actually extensions of the warrior himself because he's going to be carrying, besides all that armor he has on, he's going to be carrying multiple weapons, not one weapon, but several weapons, which he's going to have to be able to switch off from one to another. He's going to, be able to, he's going to have to uh, wear some kind of a shield also and be able to use that both defensively and offensively 
And one of the things we've learned, um, particularly medieval military historians have learned by studying uh, especially the Spanish writers who continue down to this day the, the art of the war horse, is that this horse participates in the battle. So that if, if you had a, a, a knight going into battle, when he goes in and, and you're up against him, it, it it helps if you're on a horse too. Yeah. If you're not on a horse, you're in really big doo doo, yeah. um, because you're going to have to be watching this this knight and his multiple weapons, also his shield, which he can use as a weapon to hit mm -hmm. you with, also the horse, who is trained to stomp on you and to bite you. Oh my gosh! So this is an awesome weapon, uh, the horse itself, and so that boy has to become one with that horse. So that's one thing there. Sword play. Um, wooden swords, constantly, constantly fighting with swords. Um, and then two other, and then hunting. Hunting becomes a big thing, not only to be able to get lots of food, but also it's, it's that, that blood sport kind of thing, which uh, is, is inculcated in these young men. And then two other um, things that you don't think of being related and one is wrestling, and the other is courtly dance. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And you think, what? I wouldn't what? guess the last one. Wrestling, maybe. But... Yeah. But no, courtly dance is as important as wrestling. Yeah, they got to perpetuate. Well, and, and they come in contact. You're coming in contact with a partner, oh, right? Oh, sure. And both in dance and in wrestling, you have to read the movement of your partner. Yes. Okay. And what that translates to in battle is to be able to read the movement of your enemy. If your enemy is feigning to the right and going to the left, you have to be able to know that or you could be killed and right. your arm cut off or something. So it's important for you to have all of, wow. all of those skills. So here you have uh, it, so it, dance it, is so important. Huh? <laughs> dance is so important. That's right. <laughs> um, you have a whole skill set that's developed by these young boys as they go into uh, through their puberty, so that by the time they're 20 years old, these are awesome warriors. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and and again, we we often have these these very strange notions of of knights. Um, you know, but but in actuality, there there are they are the professional athletes. They're not bulky, they're right? Not, they're not on steroids or anything like that. These are lean young men who are just tough. They're tough, right? You know, and and that's exactly what's needed for that particular age. Uh, if you ever find yourself having an opportunity to pick up a uh, a, uh, a, a two-edged sword. Uh, one of these, these you know, like five foot swords. Years back, I don't know that I'll ever have another opportunity, but years ago, back in the 70s, myself and two Christian brothers were traveling in Europe, and uh, I think it was in Austria, uh, we kind of befriended a, uh, a curator of a museum, and oh. he, he let us actually handle a medieval two edged sword. This oh, thing man. like three and a half feet tall. Week long, we couldn't believe how heavy this the thing weight. was. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking to ourselves, oh, yeah, you know, these, these, because we're looking at the armor, and these guys were little, you know, five foot four, five foot five, five foot six, maybe, and, uh, you know, maybe 145 pounds. And they're wielding this sword that they would be using in battle, and, and a melee is going to last between six and 12 minutes. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> And, uh, and 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 so this is um, these are the kind of things that they're going to uh, have to be able to do. Now, interestingly enough, some knights never get around to getting a fief. Uh. <laughs> uh, some you can imagine mm -hmm. uh, it, it happens occasionally um, that, that just doesn't come available, and so you, you have a young man who goes through all the training, uh, gets into his twenties, makes his oath of fealty. He stays at the castle. He's still a uh, household um, um, vassal. And uh, he's there 10, 12, 15, 18 years. Now he's 38 years old. Uh, that's the upper edge of the cannon fodder oh, age. You know, a 38-year-old yeah. is getting a bit old on the old uh, scale there to be a, a warrior. And so what happens is that 
some, there comes a point in time in which the Lord and the vassal make an agreement and they kind of cut them loose. Um, he, he's known as a, he's received, uh, he receives what's called a, a fief de chambre, a fief of the room. And what it basically is, is a gift of money. Okay. He's simply given this money and he's, and they say, uh, uh, go off, uh, have Enjoy a good life, life <laughs> and we'll call you whenever we need you. <laughs> But the chances are we're probably not going to need gonna you. Need you know, we're, we're going to be pretty desperate to call you, know, call you up. But um, anyway, that it, sometimes it's a fief of money. Sometimes it's a fixed salary uh. in which he receives on a regular basis from the Lord in which he supports himself. And then when he's called upon, is brought back to service, whatever that service might be. Uh -huh. um, as a rule, service is 40 days in time of war you can be expected to be called up for 40 days. Okay. And uh, other times you could be called up to attend to the uh, Lord's court. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it might be something as simple as they're having a feast and they mm -hmm. want you, you want some uniforms around, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of window dressing. In some cases you'd be called up for what's called a, a, a castle guard in which you are assigned duties to guard a castle at any particular time. All of this has to be done reasonably. The Lord is not able to ask you to do anything that is unreasonable. And the other thing you have is uh, you have the obligation of giving your best advice to the Lord when he asks for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, not, and not otherwise. That's right, yeah. yeah. If he doesn't ask, you don't give. <laughs> But if he does, you do. And then sometimes there's also something else, and it's it's called aid. It's a technical term meaning out of your own resources. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I found to be so fascinating was, especially among the Carolingians, the Carolingians had divvied up so many of these fiefs all over central France, You know, the, what's called the Ile de France. And what's so fascinating is that they set these fiefs very purposely about one day's distance from the other. And so, talk about moochers. Mm -hmm. What they did was these kings and their courts simply moved from, from vassal to vassal, the and they were expected to give hospitality mm -hmm. to the court. And so that meant food, it meant drink, it meant fodder, uh, it, to basically an itinerant court. Mm -hmm. And we know for a fact that the Carolingians traveled around mm -hmm. doing this. This just simply became expected. And uh, others would do the same thing. Um, bishops typically did the same thing, uh, traveled around and visited various, the wealthier parishes, the ones that could feed sure. them nicely. You know. <laughs> but on the best show. Yes. Uh, what happens then is over time, and I say this is over time, that these castles and these manors then proved to be sturdy defenses against the Vikings, the Magyars, and the Muslims. They're not able to break down, uh, break these down, and not only that, that the feudal castle, the castle itself, which is full of boys, young men, and trained warriors, does two things. It um, it projects power, and it protects the weak, mm -hmm. so that when a region is under attack. The weakest of the weak, the peasants, remember the, the, um, the serfs, mm -hmm. they and their families and their cattle and everything run to the protection of the castle mm -hmm. and they're admitted, they're brought in. That's the obligation of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so they protect the people in the region. It's protection, but it's also projection. Mm -hmm. Projection in the sense that a column of these knights goes out into the region and where they go, they project power mm -hmm. and, uh, and and protection for the people. So it's a combination of of, uh, of, of both of those, and and that's what that that castle is. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, life in a castle. Okay, I, I think it's kind of fascinating stuff. Uh, typically, um, they had one meal a day. Uh, you had a little little tiny meal at the beginning, which broke your fast. Hence, breakfast. breakfast. And then you had the main meal, which was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And typically, um, the, the knights who were going to be gathering, usually in a large hall, 
Uh, and we still have these castles. I, I've visited a number of them in Germany and Austria. Uh, I haven't been to, to as many in France or England or Italy, but uh, typically there, there's a large knight's hall with great big tables, you know, and, and, and the knights would gather there. And typically their meal at 2 o'clock in the afternoon consisted of red meat, mm -hmm. uh, poultry, bread, pastries, nice little dessert, and wash that down with either beer or wine, depending on where you're from, mm -hmm. and lots of it. Mm -hmm. um, they had, uh, in, in some of these castles, they actually had beakers that were set up to show the standard amount that, that a knight would have. And typically, a knight had between 1.5 and 2 liters of either beer or wine a day. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. uh, they were pretty... Heavy. That's a lot. The others, meaning <laughs> if you had a chaplain, the, the priest, or the women, had a liter each. <laughs> now, that's still a pretty hefty amount of that's wine a lot. and beer that's a, in one might, day. It might be extending that uh, one to two glasses per day <laughs> by <laughs> yeah. a dad. <laughs> yeah, all right. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's the Mediterranean diet. For that's you. right. That's right. <laughs> um, as one could imagine, considering that much being consumed, mm -hmm. uh, the morals in the castle uh, certainly uh, could be improved. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the biggest violation of morals was um, violence, mm -hmm. and particularly it's 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 uh, all throughout Europe. It is it's just men violently treating their wives and also servants. So it, you have a very, very strange mixture of things here. Typically in a castle or in a manor, uh, you had men daily attending mass, yeah. giving alms, mm -hmm. going to confession often. I mean, weekly confession. Because it was easier to go to confession than it was to change your habits and stop feeding people. Oh, wow. Women were typically treated as minors. Mm -hmm. it, it's M-I-N-O-R-S. Okay, as as children, they were treated as children, specifically because they weren't they weren't fighters. They weren't in that warrior class, and that's why women were treated the way they were. Um, on the other hand, women who were bright and shrewd. Uh, and, and able to take advantage of the of this sense of uh, courtly chivalry that develops in time, and particularly in those areas that have a very high esteem for um, for female saints or for the Blessed Virgin. Mm -hmm. Those women who were able to emulate that kind of demeanor found themselves having great control over the man who, by legal rights, had much control over her. Right. And, and it's one of the reasons why a chess set, the most powerful and the most vital piece, of course, is the king. Mm -hmm. Lose the king, you lose the game. But the most powerful piece is the queen. Mm -hmm. And often when, uh, when the man uh, left, the, the, the woman was in charge, and she, he was in charge of men. It was only her husband that she wasn't in charge of. And the church often tried to uh, regulate, in some way or another, uh, this relationship. Um, I, I remember coming across um, a regulation that that, uh, that the uh, that some dioceses has instituted and tried to apply to nobles, so that they would regulate the diameter of a stick that the husband could beat his wife with. Oh yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's you know, it, it's a real mixed um, mixed uh -huh. bag kind of a thing. The fact of the matter is that, that manors were relatively comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, these are big houses that were usually um, open. Uh, they would have maybe some walls or, around them uh, further out, but uh, they were mainly used for food production. That was the key behind a manor. They were not real defensive. Mm -hmm. uh, castles, on the other hand, are military um, structures. Uh, I don't know that I, I don't my French fails me here and I don't know that there's a a, a real uh, distinction uh, between the two in French in German there certainly is uh, if you refer to a um, 
a fortress as a burg. It's a military installation. If, okay. it, it, if it, it's referred to as a schloss, it's a manor. It's, okay. it's, a, it's, a, it's a palace. Okay. There's a, you see the difference mm -hmm. there. But the military structures, the castles are uncomfortable. They are cold. They are cramped. Um, just not a nice place to, um, uh, to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, the manors, you have the Lord's house itself. The Lord is going to protect you. Uh, if you're a peasant or a serf living on his manor, he'll protect you. You have to feed him. And typically, uh, the arrangement was that a peasant would work three days a week for the Lord and the other three and a half days for himself and his family. Okay. Uh, three days for the Lord. Again, you know, uh, and then sometimes more during harvest time. But again, we have to think about, you know, we as modern Americans, um, how much of our time is... is um, uh, do we spend working in order to pay the taxes we pay? Right. It, it's it's probably about the not a bad deal. <laughs> it's, that's probably true. Probably better than yeah. we are now. Uh, there's a great story uh, that I came across in a book called The Divine Companions. I, I'm sorry, The Divine Campaigns, and it, it has to do with the relationship between a priest and a peasant. Oh. And it seems as though this priest, uh, his name is Canon Etienne. Now, he's a canon, so that would tell us that he is a city priest okay. uh, living in the household of the bishop. And he's probably received some land from some way in his family. We don't know for a fact, but he has some land. We know that. And he writes up an agreement, uh, a tree, uh, uh, what do we call this, uh, a contract with a peasant who's living on his land, man by the name of Guichard. And, and here's the contract. Okay, You can live on my land, and you can raise everything you want, and you can keep everything you want, but what I want in exchange is, at Easter, you supply me with a lamb. Okay. okay. During the hay season, you can keep the hay and sell it, but I want six coins. Okay, that's that's my portion of it. Uh, during the grain season, I want a certain portion of oats, mm -hmm. which the priest would then turn around and sell in town and make money off of that. Plus, once a year, uh, during the grain season, I uh, I want to I want you to throw a party for me and my friends, uh -huh. and you and you other peasants uh, are going to serve, serve this, this party. Okay, so once a year you got to throw a party. During the grape harvest, you can keep the grapes and sell the grapes and do whatever you want, but I want a certain number of coins, and I want three loaves of bread, and I want some of that wine. <laughs> okay, and then during the winter, you don't have to pay me anything because that's the rough season. Can't grow anything. Right, and all the way up until Lent. And when Lent comes, I want a capon, a big pigeon. <laughs> that's it. So okay. the peasant, it's, it's not a bad, it's a kind of a it's sweet arrangement. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, basically, um, he, he can use his own initiative. If he works real hard, right. he can do pretty well for himself. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't work real hard and he just provides the basics, you know, so there's a real reward uh, system involved in, in that kind of uh, relationship. That's the kind of contract that begins developing over the later period as you get deeper into the Middle Ages. In other words, there's nothing mentioned in this contract between the peasant and the priest about protection. Uh, uh -huh. It's simply an economic arrangement. Okay. So as you get into the, uh, into the, the, the Middle Ages more, there's a shift away from protection and uh, uh, toward um, economic productivity. And, and what we find is that, p that even peasants are eating better. They're eating uh, beans and lentils and peas, all of which are protein rich. Mm -hmm. They have a little bit more meat than what they had at the beginning, which was probably just about nothing. There is going to be some milk available and some cheese is going to be able to be made from that. They're going to be eating wheat and barley and oats and rye, all of which can be um, uh, fermented and turned into beer. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the Irish are going to discover that you can distill the fermentation and make <laughs> whiskey from that. Um, and, then, and then they're going to be very generous and, and give the formula to the Scots, who will come up with scotch. 
Um, and so that when you get into the 900s and the thousands, uh, you're going to have a a great um, uh, renaissance in the Middle Ages. So that after having gone those, through those 300 horrible years, Western civilization is going to enter into a whole new period, and and this period is going to be one of um, of, of great produce. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'll discover is what's called the three-field system. And in the three-field system, what you do is you leave one field. You, you divide up your land into three fields. And one field, you don't plant anything. Mm -hmm. You let it go it to rests. seed, uh -huh. uh, fallow. And then what happens is you take your cattle and your sheep or whatever, and they go out there and they eat all the grass and the weeds and all that and of course while they're out there they also poop mm -hmm. and then you end up with all that natural manure right through the ground so for a year uh, all you're doing is you're feeding nutrients back into back that into soil, the, soil. Mm -hmm. um, the other field the second field is uh, is set aside for winter grains uh, and then then the other third field is going to be set aside for spring uh, sowing of of uh, beans, legumes, oats, mm -hmm. things of that nature. So by organizing this in a systematic way, you're going to have um, uh, you're going to have an increase in food, and therefore now you'll be able to have an increase in population again and in health. Right. People will live longer, and the end result is by living longer, they're going to be hopefully a little more wise, mm -hmm. and um, the, the wisdom quotient of, of Europe will, uh, will continue. In the south, this is going to be done through square fields. And the reason for that is that uh, independent family farms are going to operate, and the family itself now is going to become nuclear again. And people will be sharing animals with each other, mm -hmm. especially the... Uh, horses that will be used for uh, shallow plowing. Mm -hmm. In the north, on the other hand, um, in, in they can't use square fields because the northern soil is rougher and the, and the, the, um, uh, the climate is, is more severe. There's a lot more rain in the north. So you're going to have to have an oxen then. And these oxen are going to pull very deep plows mm -hmm. and the deep plows are going to go in rows. You hear the the term uh, a tough row to hoe. Uh -huh. Well, that's what that row is is all about. And in many cases, you're going to have to have four to eight oxen in order to pull this uh, uh, this um, uh, long um, to make the trough to make the trough mm -hmm. to, to do that. Yeah, and that's going to be beyond any individual of having that. That's where the cooperation then is going to... We've already seen cooperation between lords and vassals in mm -hmm. organizing a protective society. Now we see the same thing happening in um, in villages and on manors in which people are going to, through cooperation, are going to share resources in order to get by. Mm -hmm. We'll find that with the oxen. We'll find that with the hoe itself. Uh, we also are going to find that with... Um, with uh, bakeries, with um, uh, mills, where there'll be one that'll be set up for everybody. Everybody will have an opportunity to, to use them. This is going to be cooperation, not communes. Right. And so communism itself never has a hold in, in medieval Europe. Uh, these are not communes. These, these are, this is done through cooperation itself. The yield is going to be pretty low. Uh, basically, it takes two bushels of grain in order to get ten bushels of, of, of uh, produce. Uh, that's pretty dismal by today's comparisons, of course. But uh, and it's also going to show the importance of uh, of retaining seed over a, over a uh, a year in order to to do that. Mm -hmm. Each household is going to have its own garden, maybe a little pig or something like that. And, uh, and everything revolves around the manor mm -hmm. and the cooperation of that and also around the parish church. And that parish church in every village is going to be central to the life of that village, the spiritual life of that village, as well as the communal life of that village. 
So this is um, basically the um, the Middle Ages as as the um, Europeans put themselves back together again, reorder their society in a very creative way through feudalism, and basically from one end of Europe to another, everything is organized like this. Uh huh. Everything, including the church. Okay. Well, they figured out a way to survive, at least. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, right. Okay. Next time around when we come back, we're going to see how this system specifically, how it corrupts okay. the church, particularly the, the priests, the bishops, mm -hmm. and the popes, and how they're, they're weighed down by the system so that we'll understand why the reformers come along when they do and how they do in order to bring about a, a reformation. To fix it, the problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Father. Shall we close today? Let's do it. Uh, glory be to the Father, glory to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Okay. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.